welcome everybody to our lecture on deep learning. Today we want to go into the topic and we want to introduce some of the important concepts and theory that have been fundamental for the field. An old saying, and I don't know who brought it up first, uh, which says, there is nothing more practical than a good theory. Okay, today's topic will be feed-forward networks. And feed-forward networks are essentially the main configuration of neural networks as we use them today. So in the next couple of videos, we want to talk about uh, first the model and some ideas behind it, also introduce a bit of theory. One important block will be about universal function approximation, where we will essentially show that uh, neural networks are able to approximate any kind of function. The stuff that works best is really simple. This will then be followed by the introduction of uh, the softmax function and introduction of some activations. And in the end, we want to talk a bit about how to optimize uh, such parameters. And in particular, we will talk about the backpropagation algorithm. We have a search technique, which is just local search, gradient descent. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the model. And what you heard already is the perceptron. We already talked about this, which was essentially a function that would map any input, any high dimensional input using weights and uh, compute an inner product of, uh, with a weight vector with the input. And then we are only interested in the signed distance that is computed this way. And you can interpret this essentially as you see here on the right hand side. And this is uh, a line. So this is the decision boundary here shown in red. What you're computing with this inner product is essentially a distance, a signed distance of a new sample to this decision boundary. And if we then only look at the sign, we will decide whether we are on the one side or the other side. But AI is not magic. Now, if you look at uh, classical pattern recognition and machine learning, we are still in this domain right now where we would typically follow um, a so-called pattern recognition pipeline uh, where we have some measurement that is converted and then pre-processed in order to increase the quality, decrease noise. But in the pre-processing, you essentially stay in the same domain as the input. So if you have an image as an input, the output of the pre-processing will also be an image, but with probably better properties towards the classification task. Then we want to do feature extraction. You remember the example with the apples and pears. And from these, we extract those features, which then results in some high dimensional vector space. Which is basically a vector space representation, summing up uh, the input from all sensors. Th that doesn't, does not show any pictures. And in this vector space, we can then go ahead and do the classification. Now, what we've seen in the perceptron is that we are able to model linear decision boundaries. And uh, this immediately then led to the observation that perceptrons cannot solve the logical exclusive OR, the so-called XOR. And you can see the visualization of the XOR problem here on the left-hand side. So uh, imagine you have some kind of distribution of classes where the top left and the bottom right is blue and the other class is uh, bottom left and top right. So if you look at this, this is inspired by the logical XOR function, then you will not be able to separate those two point clouds with a single linear decision boundary. So you either need curves or what can help you in this kind of constellation is you use multiple lines. But with a single perceptron, you will not be able to learn to solve this problem. Because people have been arguing, look, we can model logical functions uh, with perceptrons. And then if we build perceptrons on perceptrons, we can essentially build all of logic. You can build a machine that learns to solve more and more complex problems and more and more general problem solver, then you basically ha have um, solved all the problems at least all the solvable problems. Now, if you can't build XOR, then uh, you're probably not able to, to describe the entire logic, and therefore we will never get there. 
this was a period of time where funding to artificial intelligence research was tremendously cut down and people would not get any uh, new grants, they would not get money to support the research. This period became known as the AI winter. And winter is coming. Things changed with the introduction of the multilayer perceptron. This is now the expansion of the perceptron, but you not just do a single neuron, but you use multiple of those neurons and you arrange them in layers. So here you can see a very simple draft. So it is very similar to the perceptron. You have essentially some inputs, some weights, and now you can see that it's not just a single sum, but we have several of those sums that go through nonlinearity and then they are assigned weights again, are summed, again are summed up again, and go into another nonlinearity. AI yeah, is actually a grab bag of different techniques. So this is very interesting because with multiple neurons, we can now also model nonlinear decision boundaries. You can go on and then uh, arrange this in layers. So what you typically do is uh, you have some input layer. This is our vector x. And then you have several perceptrons that you arrange in hidden layers. They're called hidden because they do not immediately observe the input, but they uh, assign weights, then compute something. And only at the very end, at the output, you have a layer again where you can observe what's actually happening. And uh, all of these weights that are in between in those hidden layers, they are not directly observable. Yeah? You only observe them when you put some input in, compute them, and then at the very end you can um, obtain the output. So this is where you can ex actually observe what's happening in your system. So now we will look into the so-called universal function approximator. And this is actually just a network with a single hidden layer. The field is kind of stabilized to the point where some core ideas from the 1980s are still used today. So universal function approximation is a, a fundamental piece of theory because it tells us that with a single hidden layer, we can approximate any continuous function. So let's look a bit into this theorem, and this starts with a formal definition, of course. Now we have some phi, and phi is a non-constant, bounded, monotonically increasing function. And now there exists some epsilon greater than zero, and for any continuous function f defined on a compact subset of some high-dimensional space Rm, there exists an integer uh, and real constants uh, nu and b and the real vectors w uh, where you can find an approximation and here you now see how the approximation is computed. You have an inner product of the weights with the input plus some bias and this goes into some activation function that is this uh, non-constant bounded and monotonically increasing function. And then you have another linear combination using those nu, which then produce the output capital F of x. So capital F of x is our approximation. And the approximation is a linear combination of nonlinearities that are computed from linear combinations. And if you define it this way, you can demonstrate that if you subtract capital F from the true function f, the, the absolute difference between the two is bounded by a constant epsilon and epsilon is greater than zero. That's already a very useful approximation that there is an upper bound epsilon, but right now it doesn't tell us how large epsilon actually is. So epsilon may be really large, but the universal approximation theorem also tells us that if we increase n, if you increase the number of n, then epsilon goes down. And now if you approach infinity with n, epsilon will approach zero. So the more neurons we take in this hidden layer, the better our approximation will get. It's over 9,000! So this means we can approximate any function with just one hidden layer. So you could argue, 
if we can approximate everything with a single layer, why the hell are people doing deep learning? Because I'm a fucking intelligent motherfucker that knows a lot. This uh, doesn't make any sense. A single layer is enough. I've, I've just proved this to you. So there's maybe no need for deep learning. Let's look into some examples. I took um, a classification tree here. And a classification tree is a method of subdividing space. And I'm taking a 2D example here where we have some input uh, space x1 and x2. And it's a two-dimensional space. This is nice because we can visualize it very efficiently here on the slides. And our decision tree does the following thing. So it decides whether x1 is greater than 0.5. And I'm showing you the decision boundary here in the example on the right. In the next node, so let's say you go to the left hand side, you look at x2 and decide whether it's greater or smaller than uh, 0.25. In the other side, you simply look at x1 again and decide whether it's greater or smaller than 0.75. Now, if you do that, you can assign classes in the leaves. And in these leaves, you can now, for example, assign the value 0 or 1. And this gives a subdivision of the space that has the shape of a mirrored L. So this is a function, and this function can now be approximated by a universal function approximator. So let's try to do that. We can transform this actually into a network. And uh, let's use the following idea. So we have this tree. So again, our network has uh, two input neurons, yeah, because it's a two-dimensional space. With our decision boundaries, we can also form these decisions, x being greater or smaller than 0.5. Yeah? So we can immediately adopt them. We can actually also adopt all the other inner nodes. And yeah, because we are using a sigmoid in this example, then we also use the inverse of the inner nodes and put them in as additional neurons. So, of course, I don't have to learn anything here because the connections that are in the, towards the first hidden layer, I can take them from the tree. Yeah, they're already predefined, so there's no learning required here. On the output side, I have to learn some weights. And this can be done using, for example, a least square approximation. And then I can directly compute those weights. If I go ahead and really do that, we can also find a nice visualization. You can see that with our decision boundaries, essentially we are constructing a basis here. And you, here you can see if I use this uh, zero one in black and white, that for every inner node, for every hidden node, I'm constructing a base vector that is then essentially multiplied with the input space. So you could do this here by multiplying every pixel with every pixel and then simply summing up. Yeah? This is what the hidden layer here would do. And then I'm essentially interested in combining those base vectors such that it will produce the desired y. Now, if I do that in a least square sense, I get the following approximation. So it's not half bad, but let's magnify this a bit. So this is what we wanted to get. This is the mirrored L. And this is what came out of my approximation that I just proposed. Now you can see that it kind of has the L shape in there, but uh, the epsilon, you, we are here in the domain between zero and one, and the epsilon with my six neurons here is probably in the range of 0.7. So it kind of does the trick, but the approximation is not very good. And in this particular configuration, you have to increase the number of neurons really a lot in order to get the error down because it's a it's a really hard problem and can almost not be approximated here. So what else could we do? Well, if we want this, we could, for example, add a second nonlinearity because then we would get exactly the solution that we desired. So you see, maybe one layer is not very efficient in terms of representation. There is an algorithm that can map any decision tree onto a neural network. And the algorithm goes as follows. You take all of your inner nodes, here the decisions between 0 0.5, 0 0.25, and 0 0.75, 
So these are the inner nodes. And then you connect them appropriately. And you connect them in a way such that you are able to form exactly these regions here. So you see this is our L shape. And in order to construct the top left region, we need to have access to the first decision that separates the space into the left half space and the right half space and we have access to the second decision. So this way we can use these two decisions in order to form this small patch on the top left and essentially for all of the four patches that emerge from the decision boundaries we get essentially one node. Uh, this simply means that for every leaf node, we get one node in the second layer. So one node for every inner node in the first layer, one node for every leaf node in the second layer. And then you can combine them. You don't even have to compute anything here because we already know um, how these have to be merged in order to get to the right decision boundaries. And then you manage to convert your decision tree into a neural network. And it does exactly the correct approximation as we wanted to have it. What do we learn from this example? Well, we can approximate any function with a universal function approximator with just one hidden layer. But if we go deeper, we may find a decomposition of the problem that is just way more efficient. So here the decomposition was first the inner nodes, then the leaf nodes. And this managed us to derive an algorithm that only had seven nodes and could exactly approximate the problem. So you could argue that by building deeper networks, you add additional steps. And in each step, you try to simplify the function and the power of the representation such that you get a better processing towards the end. I would say deep learning is any kind of machine learning that involves learning parameters of more than one uh, consecutive step. Now let's go back to our universal function approximation theorem. So we've seen that it exists. It tells us that we can approximate everything with just a single hidden layer. So that's already a pretty cool observation, but it doesn't tell us how to choose n, it doesn't tell us how to train. So there's a lot of problems with the universal approximation theorem. And uh, this is essentially the reason why we go towards deep learning, because we can then build systems that start disentangling representation over various steps. And if we do so, we can build more efficient and more powerful systems and train them end to end. So this is the main reason why we go towards deep learning. I expect anybody who is working in deep learning to know about uh, universal approximation and why deep learning actually makes sense. Ooh, AI, it must, you know, it's magical or it can solve any problem. Well, we'll know. Okay, so that's it for today. Next time, we will talk about activation functions and we will start introducing the backpropagation algorithm in the next set of videos. So stay tuned. Hope you enjoyed this video. Looking forward to see you in the next one. Thank you.